Hello and welcome to Global. I'm Tim Wilcox, broadcasting live from the BBC's newsroom in the heart of London. Burying the dead and counting the cost, Egypt's government now says more than 500 people were killed in the Cairo crackdown. As all signs of the six-week sit-in by pro-Morsi supporters are erased, the Muslim Brotherhood says the protest will go on. And in the last few hours, their supporters have stormed and torched a government building. So, what next for a bitterly divided country? I have lost my brother, but I swear to God that I am happy that he has become a martyr. We'll be taking a look at the Muslim Brotherhood as an organisation fighting for its political life. I'll be joined in the studio by the writer and academic Azam Tamimi and from Brighton by Marise Tadros. Also ahead, Typhoon Ort Utor continues to wreak havoc, but a lucky escape for the crew of this cargo ship rescued just moments before it sank off the coast of Hong Kong. Sailors of another kind as the Pirate Bay Buccaneers pass its 10th birthday, we'll take a look at how it's changed and challenged the media industry. Also on Global Today, a little bit of natural history. wild thing on the block. Anyone heard of the Olinguito? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Global. I'm Tim Wilcox. Cairo and Egypt are holding their breath today as the funerals for those killed in yesterday's police crackdown begin. Earlier, hundreds of supporters of the Brotherhood stormed a government building in the capital and set it on fire. Let's go straight to Cairo now to my colleague, Michelle Hussein. Hello and welcome to our continuing live coverage from Cairo. I'm at the site of the Rabba al Adawiya Mosque and what remains of the bigger of the protest sites of the Muslim Brotherhood, cleared of course so dramatically by the Egyptian security forces early on Wednesday morning local time here. And it is still striking to compare the international condemnation of the violence here, the concern about what lies in the future for Egypt with what you saw in the morning papers here today in Egypt, which was, even from the newspapers that have been critical of the army in the past, widespread approval of the action that was taken against the Brotherhood. In the last hour or so, we've heard from President Obama, who's been under a lot of pressure over his administration's continuing strong military relationship with Egypt. There is to be no change to the military aid that the United States gives Egypt, but military exercises have been cancelled. So an indication there of the international concern over the events of the last 48 hours in Egypt. There are also increasing concerns about a backlash from the Muslim Brotherhood. Over Cairo today, you could see a plume of smoke, and that came from the outskirts of the city, from Giza, where Muslim Brotherhood supporters stormed and then torched government buildings. So an indication for all Kyrenes very close to home indeed of the anger that the Brotherhood feels about what has been done here. Well, my colleague James Reynolds has been talking to those directly affected uh, by the action uh, taken by the security forces and here's his latest report. This country is now beginning to learn the cost of yesterday's raid. These are the bodies of Morsi supporters laid in a mosque. Their families are with them. I have lost my brother, but I swear to God that I am happy that he has become a martyr. The minute he left home with the Quran in his hand, I knew he could become a martyr. Protesters say that this is evidence that what happened here was a massacre. This is what's left of the Rabah Mosque encampment. For six weeks, this was a refuge and a stronghold for supporters of the deposed President Mohamed Morsi. But the security forces have taken it back for the state. I pray to God Almighty to stop the bloodshed. We don't want anything more than what we have seen here. We want Egypt to live in security and stability. 
This is where protesters used to sleep. Workers are now getting rid of all signs of the six-week occupation. Official figures show that yesterday's raids was one of the most violent days in Egypt's recent history. The government insists that the police and the military acted with restraint. It's called the loss of life regrettable, but it hasn't apologized. The new month-long state of emergency gives the government extra powers. These will make it harder for the Muslim Brotherhood to get back together. But the organization promises that it will continue to protest. James Reynolds, BBC News, Cairo. Well, if you had come here 48 hours ago, you would have seen a very different scene to what it is now. Let me just show you a little bit of the area around the Rabah Mosque. Um, this was the bigger of the two protest sites in Cairo. The facade of the mosque remains uh, blackened today. There's been a big effort on the part of the army to try and clean up this area, and they're still uh, keeping up a presence on the streets. But overall, there, there is a bit of an effort to try and try and get this part of Cairo back to normal. But if you talk to people here, a lot of them are now talking about their feelings about the Muslim Brotherhood camp here and expressing um, concern about what was happening here for so many weeks, feeling that now they can reclaim this part of the city. I was speaking to one eyewitness to the bloodshed here, someone who's not from the Brotherhood, but who decided to come down when he heard the news of military action here to try and get an independent sense of what was happening. There are many different versions of what happened here at Rabah al Adawiya, but one person who was a witness to the events here is David Michel from the Free Egyptians Party. David, you are not from the Brotherhood, you're not from the security forces. What were you doing here that night? I was here like an Egyptian who is seeking for the truth to know what this brotherhood is doing and what the security is doing. I need to know the truth, not just to listen to some media or something, some, some persons who are saying this media is lying, this media is lying, so I need to see the truth with my own eyes. So that's why I was here with my camera to witness and to know what was going on really. So what did you see when you arrived here? Uh, when I arrived here first, I found the forces were just standing and using uh, this throw sound and saying you have to leave uh, and the pass the safe way is from uh, Shara and Nasr and you have to leave. And uh, This is the army essentially warning the Brotherhood. It was not the army, it was the police. The police were police warning forces. the Muslim Brotherhood supporters to get out of here. Yeah, they are warning them to leave. As uh, the Prime Minister said that this uh, protesting is over and they have to leave. And he was warning them through uh, phones and so on and saying you have to leave. And the, the safe way to leave is from their way. But suddenly I start heard, hearing uh, sh uh, shooting from their side. When you the say their side, whose side? Who was Russia shooting? Russia. The Brotherhood was shooting? Yes. Can you be sure of that? Yeah, because I found uh, an officer was uh, shooting beside me. And uh, another one was standing behind the uh, police vehicle, just trying to take a shoot. There was uh, a guard of a building from living here, from this area. He was just trying to grab some sort of things that they left after the police go further more. He take a bullet in his head. I witnessed that. I see it with my own eyes. David Michel, who was watching the events here from behind police lines. Wounds of all sorts are very, very raw in Egypt today, and it'll be a long time before there can be any genuine reconciliation process after this. But hopes of that were put back, I think, today by news from the prosecutor that President Morsi's detention order has been extended. Remember, he hasn't actually been seen in public since his removal by the army, and he remains in military detention. We'll have lots more from Cairo for you in the hours ahead. Stay with us across BBC News. For now, though, back to London.
Michelle, thank you very much. Well, uh, just over a year ago, the Muslim Brotherhood was celebrating victory in the Egyptian presidential elections. Now, it's President Mohamed Morsi, as Michelle was saying, is under arrest, its headquarters ransacked. The party that started 85 years ago is now under intense pressure. With the crackdown on supporters of the president, where does this leave the Muslim Brotherhood now? Well, I'm joined by the Middle East political analyst Azam Tamimi in the studio and from Brighton by Maris Tadros, author of The Muslim Brotherhood in Contemporary Egypt and uh, former reporter with Al Ahram uh, Weekly. And uh, Maris, if I can start with you, uh, given its 85-year history and, the, and how the Muslim Brotherhood has changed to meet the demands of each decade, where does it go from now? Well, there are lots of different scenarios possible, and I think we need to talk about different parts of the Muslim Brotherhood. So if we're talking here about the senior leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood who have been very close to political office or in political office, I think there is a great deal of anger against them from within the Brotherhood for their failures in governing Egypt over the past year. And I think probably with the crackdown, they're going to be in the, at the receiving end of the crackdown, and they're probably going to be held accountable. But I think for the rank and file of the Muslim Brotherhood, it is likely that a significant proportion of them will join the more radical uh, Salafi movement, uh, whereas um, another part of the Muslim Brotherhood, the younger members of the Muslim Brotherhood who had sought reform, I think this is a golden opportunity for them to reconfigure power relations within the Muslim Brotherhood to make it more able to adapt to the changing context. Uh, as you, as a, to me, do, do, do you agree with that? Because in the past, I mean, even though the Muslim Brotherhood is not committed to any violent change. There have been split factions within it, haven't there, which have uh, been paramilitary wings in the past. Do you think that there will be a more aggressive side to the Muslim Brotherhood now? We saw armed uh, gunmen, for example, uh, on the streets yesterday. Well, this uh, talk of uh, disagreements or divisions within the Muslim Brotherhood is something that I don't recognize. Uh, there were a few uh, members of the Brotherhood who were unhappy um, uh, more than a year ago and left the movement. But within the movement, the movement is intact. The movement is uh, uh, well organized behind its leadership. So uh, talk about the leadership standing in, on one camp and the rank and file standing uh, elsewhere, that's uh, uh, not true at all. I don't see it, I don't recognize it. And by the way, this is not an issue of the Muslim Brotherhood. I think uh, continuing to say pro-Brotherhood, pro-Morsi, uh, is a misrepresentation of what is going on in Egypt. This is a pro-democracy movement. Had this happened in Eastern Europe, everybody would, would have been calling it the pro-democracy movement. Because this is what it is about. We've had a military coup that crushed the ballot box and went against the will of the people, as expressed by the ballot box. Uh, and they are the ones who uh, perpetrated the crimes uh, yesterday. Not against the Muslim Brotherhood, but against peaceful demonstrators who included all sorts of people, including Christians, were in, uh, in, in the camps uh, with the uh, pro-democracy uh, rally. Well, you, you say that, but uh, Marie's just picking up on some of the reports of uh, Coptic Christians being attacked by uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, supporters. How dangerously out of control, potentially, do you think is the situation now uh, as far as the, the group is concerned? Yes, I think it's really important to recognize that the Muslim Brotherhood are not just victims of violence. They have been perpetrators of violence. They have had a very violent uh, history, very violent phases in their history. And what we have seen uh, during the last 24 hours in Egypt is the burning, the plundering uh, of more than 40 churches in Egypt, uh, in addition to the burning of schools, the burning of civic associations, belonging to the, the Christians and they have actually incited a great deal of sectarian violence against Christians so you can under no circumstance call them a pro-democracy okay. movement. As I'm telling me is you're shaking your head at that but I mean there is evidence isn't there there is, there is proof that these churches have been attacked. Well if anybody attacked those churches it wasn't members of the Muslim Brotherhood because it goes against the values and the principles right, of well, Muslim. Well, but well, but, okay. but, no, there's, no, but if I, if one, I may. one important thing here okay. one important thing here uh, I, I'd call on the lady to recognize that the leader of the Coptic church in Egypt sided by the coup and defended the coup. And therefore, there is anger against the Coptic church, but not from the Muslim Brotherhood. But, but does that make them fair game for the Muslim no, 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 Brotherhood? No, 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 no. It's not justified. Any attack on a church or a mosque or any place of worship or a civilian place, even a government place, is not justified. But to accuse the Muslim Brotherhood without evidence uh, is simply uh, unfair. Let's just look a, a little bit at the history of the Muslim Brotherhood, because we've got some archive uh, of, of this when it was founded uh, 85 years ago, and indeed what happened in 1952, because to say it is committed to peaceful change 
it is the it is the belief now, but there has been, haven't there, paramilitary activity in the past, uh, especially when uh, NASA took over. The uh, paramilitary organization within the, the Muslim Brotherhood existed before the revolution of 1952, and that was during the British colonial era, and that was intended against the colonial authorities as well as to serve in Palestine against the creation of a Zionist state but uh, not against the people of Egypt. Uh, but, but, never but, happened. But, but, but the leader, Qutb, um, you know, his, his, uh, his writings have been followed up by Al-Qaeda and uh, Islamic Jihad. I mean, they seem to have spawned very extreme uh, forms of is Islam. The writings of Qutb uh, have been interpreted in a variety of ways. And it is true that it is claimed by Al-Qaeda, by people like Hezbollah Tahrir, but they're also claimed by the mainstream within the Muslim Brotherhood. The important thing is, why did Qutb write the way he wrote? And that is because of the persecution meted against the Muslim Brotherhood by Gamal Abdel Nasser, hanging their leaders, torturing many of their members, imprisoning some of them for up to 20 years, rotting in jails. Uh, of course, that results in a, some, some sort of reaction. Some of it is intellectual. Some of it is expressed in uh, a, a, a certain discourse. Uh, Malis Tadros, is the Muslim Brotherhood's failure, perhaps in the last year, largely connected to the personality and character of Mohammed Morsi, and, and with a different leader, somebody who was stronger, would it would it hold more opportunity for success? Do you think? I don't think it's actually a leadership issue. I think it's an ideology and political agenda issue. The Muslim Brotherhood's ideology has never been inclusive. It has never been fully tolerant of full citizenship for Christians or women or political forces that do not have the same reference points as them. And may I just clarify that the militias, the, the Muslim Brotherhood militias, were used in December 2012 against peaceful protesters who had objected to some of President, uh, President Morsi's decrees. So you actually do have uh, a history of violence that has continued well into 2012 and 2013. And we do have very strong evidence that those that attacked the churches were pro Morsi uh, supporters based on the, the chants that they were saying, uh, based on the fact that some of the uh, leaders were identified within the, uh, by the community members. Um, and, um, and therefore, we do have a situation in which this is a, a, a movement that has never really embraced um, inclusiveness, has never really embraced for citizenship has never really embraced the ideas of accountable governance. I'm afraid uh, we are out of time, but uh, Marie Tadros and uh, Azam Tamimi, thank you both very much indeed uh, for joining us here on Global Today. Uh, stay with us uh, on the programme for a new addition to the animal kingdom as a mammals discovered in the forests of Ecuador 